Ladies and gentlemen, every year there are 200 million cases of malaria worldwide. Of these 200 million cases, we might expect about 400,000 deaths. Of these 400,000 deaths, most of these are taking place, a good sort of 90%, are actually taking place in sub-Saharan Africa. And most of these, indeed, are children under the age of five. From an economic case, the burden of malaria each year equates to about $12 billion. The burden of malaria is very real. It's very real. If I may, I'm going to quote Stalin. It's not something I do often. But he once said, he said, one man's death is a tragedy. <coughs> a million, well, that's just a statistic. And I, kinda, I get what he means here, because these numbers, as big as they are, how do we relate to these numbers? Okay, they're, they're so vast, they're so big. But what I say is I, I spend a lot of time working, in fact, indeed, living in sub-Saharan Africa. And what strikes you is that every single person that you meet, every single person in some way has been touched by malaria, has been directly affected by malaria. So from the person that's giving you a taxi ride from the airport, someone that's serving you a drink in the evening, to your colleagues that work in the Ministry of Health, everybody's been affected by malaria. And that could be as mundane as uh, they were ill earlier that year, so uh, they, they lost a bit of income because they, they weren't working for, for a month. Or indeed, that's, that's losing uh, husbands and wives, um, sons and daughters. But despite these big numbers, we've made massive strides. The community has made massive strides in controlling malaria. We take organizations like the Gates Foundation. They plowed a number, a, a, any numbers of millions into controlling diseases like malaria. And it's been hugely successful. And so one of the examples might be, I do a lot of work in Zanzibar. So in Zanzibar, about 10 years ago, of every five people that are walking around, two people would have malaria, would be carrying that malaria parasite, 40% of the population. Today, well, that's about 1%. In some cases, less than 1%. And the reason why they've been so successful is because a lot of the investment is being on indoor interventions. And these indoor interventions might be something like bed nets. So anyone that's traveled to a malarial region will know you sleep under a bed net. Why? Well, you stop yourself getting bit by a mos mosquito. Mosquito transmit any, any number of diseases, including malaria. What you might be less aware of is also there's lots of spraying of insecticide inside the homes. So in, in hot spot areas, uh, uh, areas where malaria is very prevalent, so where I was living in southern Tanzania in the Kilimbara Valley, for instance, so someone would come round and spray inside uh, my home, so especially underneath the bed, or underneath the coffee table, in the bathroom. So these are areas where the, the malaria mosquito is resting. Because a bit like us, if we've had a big meal, what we want to do is rest, right? So the mosquito will go and find a surface and rest on that surface. So you treat that surface with insecticide, or then you kill the mosquito, right? So these kind of interventions have had a huge influence. But we also, there's a really worrying trend recently. Increasingly, what we're seeing in areas like, uh, like Zanzibar, southern Tanzania, where I started to work in, in Zambia as well, those mosquitoes, they're landing on these insecticide-treated nets. They're landing on these surfaces that are treated with insecticide. But they're not dying, they're surviving. They're building up a resistance to this insecticide. And we couple that with another worrying trend. Traditionally, the species that's transmitted malaria, that tends to, tends to uh, uh, take the bulk of the transmission, well, they've evolved alongside mankind. Okay, So they've evolved alongside mankind to attack us when we're most vulnerable, which is typically 2 or 3 in the morning, the dead of night, when we're sleeping. So you sleep under a bed net, you solve the problem, right? But increasingly, what we're seeing is a species that's now taking over that transmission cycle. Well, indeed, they don't mind. They don't mind feeding on us when we're still outdoors, working the fields in the evening, walking home from work, cooking in their courtyards in the early evening. So therefore, these indoor interventions, as effective as they've been, if we don't strike now, these numbers, these malaria case numbers, they will just bounce back. So what we should do, therefore, is we should take the battle to the mosquitoes themselves. We should fight back. Okay? Now let's consider when is that mosquito most vulnerable. To do that, we need to understand a little bit about the, the life cycle of a malaria mosquito. 
Uh, it's the female mosquito that does all the damage. They, they're the ones that have the, the blood meal. And after they've had a couple of blood meals and they're nice and full, what they'll look for is they'll look for a mate. They'll mate and then they'll carry those eggs. And what they're looking for now is a water body. So what they do is they find that water body and they lay their eggs. And those eggs, they hatch into mosquito larvae. And, uh, and they buzz around on the surface. You may picture um, in, in your gardens um, or your the backyard, even in the UK in the summer, maybe you've got a bucket of water that's been left out. And sometimes if you give that a little, little nudge or a little kick, you see lots of little beasties buzzing around at the surface. Well, often they're mosquito larvae. And when those mosquito larvae are in that water body, well, ladies and gentlemen, they're vulnerable. So what we can do is we can treat those water bodies. So in somewhere like Sub-Saharan Africa, rather than buckets of water, consider marshy areas, swampy areas. We might consider the edges of rivers, the edges of lakes, things like that. And so what we can do is we can, we can visit those kind of water bodies and we can treat them. We can treat them with larvicide. Now this idea of, of treating a water body, okay, treating water bodies to kill the larvae, it's not new. So back in the 1930s, malaria was accidentally introduced to Brazil. So there was this particular port, and all of a sudden there was an epidemic of malaria right next to this port. Okay, so hundreds of deaths all of a sudden because of malaria, a disease they didn't used to have. And what followed was an all-out war against the malarial mosquito. Huge amounts of funds and resources were applied to trying to attack the malarial mosquito. So they went to the malarial mosquitoes' home, these water bodies. So within this particular location, they went to visit all these water bodies and they put a particular, a particular larvicide, a kind of larvicide, which is called Paris Green. I don't know if anybody knows their, their, their chemistry, but Paris Green, let's just consider it poison. So they poisoned all these water bodies and they did a great job at killing all the mosquito larvae. And by killing all the mosquito larvae, they, they killed off that species of mosquito, and therefore that species of mosquito isn't transmitting malaria. They eliminated malaria by treating those water bodies. Indeed, Paris Green is also very effective at killing the local ecology. Uh, it also poisoned a lot of people. It even killed a few people. Not ideal. But nowadays, what we have is very low toxicity larvicide. So much so that uh, a colleague of mine in Tanzania, he will demonstrate how safe it is by popping it in his mouth and eating it. Okay, you wouldn't have a plate full of it, but it's safe, okay? So we have our strategy. We have this clear strategy of how we might be able to combat malaria alongside really important interventions like bed nets. However, for this strategy to be, to be uh, influential, to be operational, we kind of need an army. Mussolini, he drove, he drove malaria out of Italy. He drove malaria out of Italy by finding all these water bodies and treating them just like they did in Brazil. But he actually had an army at his disposal. Well, for areas like Zanzibar, Tanzania, Tanzania across sub-Saharan Africa, there just aren't those resources. They wouldn't, be, they wouldn't be here in the UK either. So what do we do? Well, this is where geographers come to the rescue. And I must say, it's not often we, we have a crisis and we're, we're desperate to call the nearest geographer. But here, we have a light on the in the sky calling for the geographer, a big G in the sky. Well, we need, we need geographers because we as geographers, well, we know about water bodies. We know how they form, how long they persist for in the landscape. Indeed, we know how to map them. So my, my particular expertise is I, I uh, spend a lot of time analyzing satellite images, analyzing drone images. And so what I did is a, a couple of years ago, I went out to, I went out to Zanz uh, Zanzibar uh, to visit my colleagues at the Ministry of Health. And I took with me uh, a low-cost drone. This is really not fancy kit. This is the kind of, uh, this kind of drone that you might get as an expensive toy for Christmas. It's a really popular drone. Indeed, uh, if, you, if you've ever seen a video of a drone landing in, uh, let's say, the grounds of the White House or attacking a South American head of state, uh, it's probably this drone, okay? Really popular. So we took this low-cost, low-technology drone out to Zanzibar, and we went to these candidate areas. We went to an area like a rice paddy, and we flew the drone. We went to a peri-urban setting, and we flew the drone number of different sites. And what we did is we looked at those images, we looked at those photographs, and you know what? We can identify and map every single water body. It's really clear. 
Not only that, but we can also identify little paths and routes to actually, uh, to actually access those water bodies. To the point where we can say, you know what, you, 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 have to, you could drive up there, then you need to get out of your Land Cruiser there, and then you can follow this path, but not that path because it looks like it goes through somewhere, somebody's courtyard. What we're gathering is really, really detailed and precise information. What I'm terming spatial intelligence, mainly because that sounds clever. And to secure funding, ladies and gentlemen, you need to sound clever. So we have this spatial intelligence, but you know it doesn't stop there. I'd wager that most of the people watching this have a smartphone. Well, it's no different than Zanzibar. There's lots of people with smartphones. And Zanzibar is also relatively unique in that the, the approach that they've taken to treating, finding and treating these water bodies has been community-led. So it's the communities that are responsible for protecting their own homes. And actually, let's face it, they're the ones that are most intimate with that local landscape. But this time, they're going to be wandering around the landscape armed with this spatial intelligence in their pockets. So just like we might have with an in-car sat-nav, they'll be able to negotiate that landscape, find individual water bodies, they'll be able to treat them, tick them off, go and navigate to the next one, they can track their progress, they can make sure that they're eliminating, every, that they're killing all the larvae in every single water body in their area. By doing so, they're suppressing that population of mo malarial mosquitoes. In doing so, there are less mosquitoes that are going to transmit malaria. I want to leave on a really positive note. Sri Lanka have recently declared themselves malaria-free. And what I mean by that is, over the last four years, they have not had one endemic case of malaria. Not one. And they've done that not just through bed nets, but by being innovative. A combination of lots of different techniques. So innovation is the key. And when I travel and visit my friends and colleagues in Sub-Saharan Africa, I'm always amazed at the amount of ingenuity how this continent embraces, embraces innovation. And you know, with using things, technology, simple technology like drones and smartphones, well, this almost arrogant goal of a malaria elimination, well, you know what? It almost becomes tangible. Thank you.